welcome everybody. I am so excited today. Dr. Marshak. Oh, this has been a long time building. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I love the suspense. <laughs> Dr. Marshak has been so gracious to, uh, to talk to us. And um, we had a conflict earlier in the spring, but uh, we're here now and we're so excited. And, you know, as I was telling Dr. Marshak earlier, um, We've had a lot of, of different topics so far uh, this year, and um, every single one of them, from self-care to grief to um, behaviors uh, of kids with special needs to co-regulation, let's see, th th there's more, uh, trust me, there's more. Um, all of them in my mind, every time, um, every time we had webinars in my mind, it always went, but what about the marriage? You've got to have something with the marriage squared away so that you can be supported in order to <laughs> have time to go do some self-care or have both of y'all on the same page for the discipline or even just having both of y'all on the same page about understanding what's happening with your child. So um, I I'm getting chills right now as I'm talking about this. So uh, I'm so excited about this because it is, it's so fundamental to, um, gosh, Spouses just being happy in their own skin um, and then happy in the family too. And all of that just spills over to, um, to the kiddos. So I, I'm pumped and excited. I know there are so many patterns in special needs families that um, we don't talk about. It's kind of the ugly, dirty truths and maybe embarrassing or it might feel like uh, I can't hold it together like other people do. Um, so I'm just excited to, to kind of air this out, <laughs> get some questions, get some, um, get some points and see where we can really move forward with this. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Thank you, Dr. Marshak. Uh, I'm going to do a really quick, uh, who we are. Um, we are family friends in Duchenne. Um, my son has Duchenne muscular dystrophy and um, you know, there's so much information out there on the medical side of things, um, the heart, the bones, the muscles. There's not much about the relationships. And um, I have found specifically for a diagnosis like Duchenne, um, which is a, a terminal illness, um, relationships change dramatically across the board um, with yourself, with your spouse, if you're married, with your own siblings, with your children. And, you know, th this is one of those things that, that rang true for me. Um, I was reading something about grief and it said, uh, once you experience a death, and for me, the diagnosis was a type of death, um, you become a new person. You're not the same person you were before. And in my brain, I went, oh, that applies for my spouse too. So we now have two brand new people in this marriage. And it just kind of floored me. Um, so <clears throat> the relationships, <laughs> can y'all tell I'm excited? I'm really excited about today. Um, let's see, great big thank yous real quick. Thank you to Leona Phyllis, the Phyllis Law Firm for sponsoring our event. Uh, thank you to Sarah McMahon and Doug Levine for being behind the scenes brainstormers with me and huge support. Thank you to the guests. Ah, thank you for being here. It's nice to know I'm not alone in this crazy life. Uh, and then thank you to Dr. Laura Marshak for being here. So gracious with your time and, and sharing your, your wisdom. I'm going to do a real brief bio for Dr. Marshak, and then um, I'm going to let her let her talk. <clears throat> so Dr. Laura Marshak's background includes more than 30 years as a professor at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. As a licensed psychologist, she has an active practice, private, private practice, <laughs> that's hard, uh, North Hills Psychological Services PC. Her specialty has been working with couples and single parents raising children with disabilities as well as issues related to adaptation to disability. She also provides services to others with a wide range of issues, including depression, anxiety, bereavement, and trauma. Uh, her most recent, pub recent publication is a study of more than 300 fathers of children with Down syndrome about the personal impacts on their own lives. 
And lastly, she is the profession, professional advisor to Friendship Circle of Pittsburgh, an inclusion group with more than 400 members. Guys, <laughs> she's awesome. She's phenomenal. And she kind of gets us in a way that nobody else does. So I'm going to pass this over to her. I'm going to um, pin you, Dr. Marshak. And remove my pin. And here she is, guys. Right. <laughs> I, I'm really happy to be here. And I have to say, it's the first time I've done a presentation from my bedroom, much less barefoot. So <laughs> I'm hoping we feel very at home with each other. But this is a little bit different. Um, I am happy to be here because this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. And Lindy, I loved what you said about um, how disability or diagnosis of a terminal illness changes parents and of course changes the marriage. When I talk about marriage today, I'm also including um, long-term couple relationships that have not formally gotten marriage, uh, married it's the same dynamics. So let me uh, jump right in with some of the content. Um, one, there are many points I want, I hope you take away from this presentation. And one is an understanding um, that what happens to your marriage, um, I don't want you to have a fatalistic attitude about what happens with your marriage. And I've seen so many parents of kids with disabilities, and we'll talk about that more uh, in a moment. I think I have a, a slide that illustrates that pretty well, who see the challenges to the marriage and, and they're very large and say, there is no way we can make this marriage work. And so that's why this jumping off slide talks about the fact that it's not the stressors, it's the dynamics that develop as a result of the stressors. So I always do a different presentation every time I, I rework my slides a little ad infinitum. And this time I'm starting off with two spirals because what I what um, I want you to think about is how do you create an upward spiral uh, in your marriage? Because left only with the stressors, it's easy for the dynamics um, of disability or terminal illness to create a downward spiral. So when I was writing the book, Marriage with Special Children, a book I wrote with Fran Prezant, I'm going to say a dozen years ago. Um, although Fran and I knew a lot about marriage and adjustment to disability. And by the way, I didn't mention uh, in my introduction um, that I do know the topic of marriage and disability personally, uh, as well as professionally. So um, in addition to what Fran and I knew, we wanted to reach out to uh, as many parents dealing with their marriages as we could. And so you'll see throughout this PowerPoint um, slides from some of those people we were so grateful to have participate. We have a chapter in the book called Long-Term Marriages. And this is a quote uh, from a man uh, we interviewed, uh, they have a child with Down syndrome and, and a very, um, it was a very happy marriage. And, um, and his point of view, and I could not agree more, uh, he said, you can grow apart or closer depending on if you work together. And I think that's very true about the impact of illness and disability on marriage, that it amplifies uh, what's going on in the marriage otherwise. So some marriages can really bloom and some can fracture. So next slide, please. Lindy, oh, good. Okay, so so I, uh, I kind of made this point um, in the beginning, um, uh, but let me be even more explicit. And this is a little counterintuitive, but it is absolutely true that the potential of a marriage is not determined by diagnosis or severity of disability. And actually there's even some research that says that couples with children 
with mild disabilities have more marital strain than those in, with moderate or, or very severe. And um, these two quotes illustrate the different perspective people I have known have brought to the topic of marriage. So one, in the first quote was a couple I saw for counseling and I don't remember which one of them said this to me. They came into my office, they sat down, two kids on the spectrum, uh, and they looked at me almost for approval and said, in essence, of course, we had to throw our marriage overboard to take care of our children. And I thought, I know you think that's correct, but actually it's backwards, right? It's exactly what I don't want people doing. So the second quote on the slide is from a woman um, who, who I met because she uh, participated in the book. And I thought that she what she had to say uh, is pretty precious and, and it illustrates this point so well. Um, she's been married for 25 years, five children, uh, one on the spectrum and one with Down syndrome. And she said, my husband and I have a Friday night date night. Cooking is my passion. So I cook us a gourmet meal every Friday. Oftentimes we each have a child on our lap, but we still sit together with lighted candles and a glass of wine. That's one of my favorite quotes for many reasons, because she didn't get fatalistic. She didn't say, who could ever expect us to have a good marriage? You see her protecting her passion, that piece of her own life that we'll talk about more that's really important to make your own life work, to make child rearing work, and to make marriage work. Um, she also protected romance, which we'll talk more about. And um, those are some of the reasons I, I love that quote so much. Next slide, please. So I know you're all really busy and um, I wanna make the point that it's still really important to be intentional about taking care of your marriage and it doesn't take an enormous amount of time or energy. It takes being intentional and thoughtful about it and uh, deciding it's important rather than being like that couple that kind of throws it overboard or sweeps it on the side and says, nobody can expect me to think about my marriage. And this is illustrated uh, by the metaphor of gardens, right? That you could have the most beautiful garden and if you don't water it at all, pretty soon it's not going to look so beautiful. I've had couples, I had one couple, I think it was a stay at home dad. I don't, the mother was a physician. I, I, I don't remember uh, what their children had, but uh, one or both said to me, oh, we're just going to put this marriage on the back burner. And I used, I said to them a version of, that it can, oh, and they were saying because it's such a good marriage, it can withstand that marriages don't withstand that well. So you don't need enormous amount of times, but you need to be mindful about that relationship. Next slide, please. So we don't have to go through this whole list because you know the stressors. Um, but I listed some of them because I want you to know when I make recommendations that I appreciate um, the breadth and the depths of the stressors you're facing in the home. I honestly do get it. And on top of that, I think marriage alone, even if you don't have a child uh, with a serious illness or disability, I personally think marriage is also a bit of an Olympic sport, right? That uh, it takes endurance and and a lot of practice and a lot of training. And um, I don't think marriage is that inherently easy. So what I'm hoping to do in the remainder of this presentation is to break down strategies that are efficient, that make changes without enormous amounts of effort. Next slide, please. So, the first, so this talk is all about making changes. And 
I'm going to ask you to do some things that are hard. And the first one is hard. And I have to remind myself of it often. It's probably been about two days since I've tried to change my partner. But I know in the end that um, we need to, all we control is ourselves. Often what we say to our partner doesn't mean our partners don't need to make some change, but that I want you to make changes on the part that you can control. And it's usually your own actions. Um, I once had a client, um, had a child with spina bifida and a husband that was very disengaged. And I think a lot had to do with his own grief at first. Uh, and I said to her, just pretend he's a stone, like one of those moon rocks that's inert that you can't change. And let's just work on you. And it created many, many changes in a much better marriage. So that's why I'm saying don't focus on changing your partner. Not that they probably don't have plenty to change. We all do. So the other thing I want to say is I want you to think about making one or two changes first. I'm going to present 10 of them. None of them are easy, right? We could talk for an hour about each one of them, right? But each of the 10 that I present is important um, and they're possible um, to make good progress on. So this little illustration um, of the arrows has to do with the fact that change is typically reciprocal over time. So that's why we don't work on changing our partner because if we change or our actions towards the marriage change, our partner typically changes and it changes the marriage. And sometimes it doesn't take anything all that enormous. And the last point I want to add to this is, you know, most behaviors occur in a context. And I, I will say I see more wives than husbands, although I've done a lot of work with fathers, like in Lindy said in that one article, which is really interesting. And we can talk about that. But, um, and I don't want to sound too gendered or sexist with any of this, but, um, but, but I have worked more um, with mothers and they often are quite critical of husbands, but don't always take a look at their part in that marital dance, which is not going well. So that's what was in the back of my mind when I wrote this slide. Lindy, the next one, please. So um, I added a picture of ripples on this because it's that idea of when we make a, a change, it, it ripples out and creates other change. And on this slide, this is just a slide you could refer back to because it's a list. It should say the 10 steps here. I Oh, I do have 10. I just didn't format it well of those 10 steps. Okay, that is, we'll talk about each one of them so we can move on to the next slide, please. So, this first one is probably the most important and it's incredibly hard, um, but so important and it's something you will work on over time. And I have this quote, I'm going to say I held on to this quote for 20 years from this Dr. Gallagher. I cannot find what article it's from or who Dr. Gallagher is, but I wanted to give him credit because I think he said it beautifully. And he said, there needs to be a place for disability in the family, but disability needs to be kept in its place. And that is hard to do because you, you know that it goes beyond the saying, but you know that saying a mother's never happier than the her least happy child? That's a mild version. And so when there is something right yet wrong with the child, threats, to their life or facing a shortened life. I understand it's very hard to say, contain that. Don't let that become all of life. Um, so I know how hard it is. Um, 
but that doesn't mean it's not essential. Now, why I highlighted guilt uh, in this title is I think I maybe one exception, but in I'm going to say 30 plus years of working with parents of kids with disabilities and illnesses, maybe once I met a mother who never felt any guilt about it. But typically I find that people come up with kind of convoluted reasons about why this happened to their child and they can feel far-fetched, right? When they're expressed to somebody else, but they're very real. So guilt is such a huge part of this and fighting it. And then there are issues with survivor guilt. You know, how can I go out with my husband or how can I take a craft class if my child is at home, maybe with not many friends or struggling with something medical? So this is very hard to do, but it's very essential. Next slide, please. So this is a quote that I think somebody sent to me. Um, the first place I found support was through an internet group. That was my lifeline. And I used to be online till two, three, four in the morning. There was one mom whose kid was born a week apart from mine and her diagnoses were happening at the same time. We shared the same experience so intimately at night. She was my husband and I was hers, meaning they partnered up. I remember finishing a conversation with her and going in to talk to my husband who was working. I was mad that he was working because he had something else to do and I only had this. And I think it illustrates a lot of what can go wrong early on. And by the way, it's fine to have things go early on, wrong early on in a marriage. It's like very understandable. The issue is getting it back on track and that can happen. But with this quote, we see she's consumed and her intimacy, her partner became another mom because they could talk about the disability or the illness the whole time. And then we see something I'll be talking about later that she was mad he was working because it's something else to do and she only had that. And that gets that issue becoming consumed. It also gets an issue we'll talk about more, probably in about 15 minutes, about role changes and resentment. Okay, next slide, please. So you can see the difference in these two Venn diagrams. Um, what I would wish for all of you to achieve is that first one where you're a couple raising children. And if the child, thank you, Lindy, is that white grayish circle in the middle, you can see that it doesn't overlap that whole connection. It's not all of the marriage. And, and that's really important. And I really could have made that bigger, but you get my point. So that's a couple raising children. What I would not wish for you and what happens too often um, is what becomes parent partners where it's only about the child. The relationship has not been nourished. It's like that garden gone dry and you're connected only about the child. Thanks, next slide please. So, one of the things that you could think about doing, and it's not that hard to do, and it goes with containing your consumption, is to devote intentionally 20 minutes a day, a minimum, to your partner, to being with your partner, not talking about a child, right? Really perhaps checking in about their day and talking about yours, but not child related. Right? It can be used for romance, all kinds of things. 20 minutes, you can do with 20 minutes. And 20 minutes, and we often don't safeguard 20 minutes. 20 minutes truly, I did the math, is not, it's less than 2% of your day. So it seems like a lot, but it's less than 2% of your day. And on this, I put a second 2%. So that time for the marriage, it's either just 
let's say it's just that pink. Green, that slice, would be if you devoted 20 minutes simply to yourself, okay? It's a small part of the day and it needs to be protected. Next slide, please. So, um, I could not believe this more. And I know self-care often drops by the wayside and, and marriage is hard. Disability and illness are hard. Life is hard. Um, we have issues with extended families and others in our life, right? Life is good, but it is hard. And so self-care is not optional. And it can take many, many different forms, right? It can take a little yoga at home. I've meditated through thick or thin. It can take the form of uh, going out with a woman friend for dinner or a glass of wine. It could take it could take the form of a little ritual every morning. You go outside with a cup of coffee on on the deck. Right? It can take many different forms. Uh, it can take uh, take the form of therapy. I'm a big believer in therapy. Uh, it could take many different forms, but it's just not optional. And I think you all know the research, hopefully, on what can happen to caregivers. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, so uh, this is a quote, and then I'll explain the picture. This is a quote um, from a mother of uh, at least one child with autism. Uh, and after a presentation, she said this to me. She caught me, and I said, can I use that? She said, we give up our interests and take on a new identity, which we've talked about, only to feel sorry for ourselves later and blame our spouses. So this one deals with resentment really well, too. And um, yeah. so that picture, <laughs> I, I, I laugh because this was a long time coming. I have a client with a child on the spectrum. She's a solo parent now. And um, and then another child with huge behavioral uh, problems, huge. And I've been on her about hobbies, hobbies, hobbies. I'm a big hobby person. I, I do some artwork on the side and I think it goes really far in life. And so she sent this to me last week. It says, my first piece, Dr. Marshak. And it was something she had assembled from parts of glass that she broke into really a lovely image. So she was delighted when I asked her if I could use that. But even for me, I'm a, I do a lot of fused glass. I used to do stained glass. Even having it in the basement, right? So if kind of hell would break out with my child, actually more than one, I could start thinking about glass colors, what my next project is, or I could stress why something on whatever I was creating didn't look right, okay? So it's really important. Next slide, please. So um, you get my point, taking time for yourself. The important part on this slide is even if a child is still struggling and we do it while they're struggling because that may never really and that's probably when we need it the most. So I have a pie on that because you saw my pie chart before. And it, it's like, take that sliver for yourself no matter what. And um, I don't wanna talk too much <laughs> about home since this is being recorded, but with one son, I used to say to him, you know, you're only 20% of this family, right? When he'd want, all the time and attention and, and need. I'd say, daddy's 20%, I'm 20%, your two brothers are 20%, you're only 20%. Well, the truth is he probably got 65% of time and attention at times. But him knowing that it was 20% for him reminded me, reminded me I get 20%. And 
it also reined him in. I mean, what happens a lot when we have an ill child or a child with a disability is it all revolves around them. And I've worked a lot, for example, with um, adults with cerebral palsy who grew up. And, you know, they did not, of course, they did not like being the center of attention always where if they could walk and how they were doing with, with life revolving all around them, that that's not great for the child either to be the center. And so reining them in and having them only be a part of the pie and everyone else being part of the pie is really important. My last little comment there is about the law of diminishing returns. Taking time and attention for other things, including self-care, probably does not change a child's life. So, law of diminishing returns. Next slide, please. So, uh, embrace differences. This is so important. I had a great uh, little illustration that I didn't have uh, license to reproduce but uh, uh, the yin and yang kind of running towards each other, embracing. So, um, because that's what we need and it's hard to do. So let me talk about differences because they matter in terms of um, emotional differences, difference in, in child rearing, et cetera. But first, um, the research says we really do marry people who, who are different than ourselves on some level. You know, I know I've had a lot of couples who say we're so different, we can't get along. But, but the research says we often on a less conscious level um, find somebody who compliments us, who may have a quality that we don't have. Um, for example, if we're really emotional, we it's not, a coincidence that we're likely to end up with kind of a more stoic individual and it's to bring a balance. Research also says, and I think you, you may know this yourselves, that we may be attracted to the difference and then we reject it once we have it. So it's a whole thing to be careful with we wish for. And then we act like we wish we had married ourselves, which <laughs> probably would not be a good idea either. So one of the things I want you to think about, and, and I, I married a man very different from myself, um, and I have to stop and do this myself after 30, I've been married I think 38 years, <laughs> but to say, what is good about my partner's perspective? And it could be, I'm so annoyed by what he's saying. I can't believe he's saying that, right? But that intentional step of what is good about the fact that he sees it differently from me. And in the end, that's essential for being a team, which we'll talk more about. Next slide, please. So I'm heading into talking about emotional differences. And I don't know if you remember teeter-totters or seesaws. Um, and I think about them when I think about couples in their emotional life. And you certainly see it around terminal illnesses. You see it um, with other conditions that cause grief. And when one is really in a dark, sad place, the other person is often more up because if you're both totally down at the same time, it's hard to keep an emotional balance in the marriage and in the home. So there's a lot of emotional teeter tottering and sometimes, like the little kid in the red shirt, they, well, it's a reverse. One tries to balance the other out. Next slide, please. So, um, one of the things that happens early on when there is a diagnosis that is really uh, terribly distressing Couples get alienated by the fact that their partner is responding differently when uh, there's so many reasons why they are, but we get alienated by it. Um, and uh, here's one uh, quote someone shared for the book. Uh, I know when our son was diagnosed, I had terrible guilt feelings. I felt that my husband didn't really care. The diagnosis didn't seem to phase him at all. 
that made me feel like the feelings I was having were not important or not warranted. And I'm always sad when a couple gets too divided over that. And, and obviously that's a picture of one weeping Alice and the other just boxing up their feelings, which you see more with men, but I've seen it with women too. Next slide, please. So, all right. So let me read those quotes through with you. They're both, uh, have been clients of mine. So uh, one said, um, and she's a mother of a child with cerebral palsy and quite severe cerebral palsy. I would say that husbands and wives need to give each other the freedom to cope with and express feelings differently. My style of coping is to gather as much information as I can about the disability and treatment. And by the way, that's an understatement. I remember her, right? That was enormous. Uh, at first, when my husband didn't behave the same way, I thought he didn't care. Now I realize his focus is more on how our son is like other children. I think this gives us our son a healthy balance. It's really kind of, yeah. And it's also some balance in the, in the family in terms of how they're looking at their son. Um, and this other one is um, a father that I know. And he wrote, uh, I think men get a bad reputation for not accepting disabilities. We may respond differently, but every father I've spoken to knows his child has issues. We're just as hurt and traumatized by the knowledge when we learn about it, but are expected to take strong roles and not react strongly. That's both socialization and the teeter-totter of it. Part of this is to keep balance, I think. I've always accepted my son's diagnosis. I realize he has problems, but in my eyes, he's not disabled. He is, I think, differently abled and needs help relating that to the real world. And the mother does not always like that perspective. She thinks he's not focusing on the child's needs, but he so is. It's a different perspective. Next slide, please. So <laughs> this is from a mother uh, that has three children with fragile X syndrome. And if you don't know that, that's a spectrum disorder that has a lot of other very serious complications, including physical ones. So she wrote, I actually value his different child rearing habits. As much as children need consistency, I think they also need to experience two different ways of doing things. As an illustration, there was a picnic one time and the kids got into condiment fight where they started squirting ketchup and mustard at one another. Well, the men, uh, they're only guys there, stripped all the kids and hosed them down. I think that's probably to their undies. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd have a problem with this. <laughs> what mothers would have done that? I don't think any, but the kids were fine and had a great time. Guys think of a different way of doing things. And I'm sure that would make some parents feel out of control. I work with a lot of parents and kids on the spectrum, so sensory things and all that, they might've put an end to it, but it was actually a really good thing. If we don't let our husbands do things differently or our wives, I may have some men on this, that person's not a full parent team member, they're an assistant. And then they uh, kind of drop out of the process. So this is really important about embracing differences in child rearing. If we insist we know best all the time, we have problems. Okay, next slide, please. So um, I think resentment um, is one of the most toxic things in a marriage when it comes to special needs. The other one that I don't have a separate slide for, but it's true, but it's detachment, right? It's when we go on with our own life separately. Um, so I'm often thinking about resentment and I'm only going to say a little bit about it now, but when we get to role change, part of the reason we'll spend the time we do on it is because it, it helps address resentment. All right, next slide, please. So, um, I love this quote. Um, from the mother of a child with 
by the bifida. And that requires a lot of care and enemas and all kinds of things. So she wrote, it all started with resentment. My husband felt helpless and overwhelmed. This was early on. I took over caring for our son as many of us will. Then he pulled away. I resented him for this and didn't show any care towards my husband. That, that unwatered garden. I was angry about how much was on my shoulders. So I told myself, quote, he can take care of himself. Then he began to resent our son because I took care of him. So um, it's a whole, when we talk about, I call this the resentment dance as a cycle that we need to be very careful not to do. And the way out of that dance really is to encourage it a lot of, of teaming, um, often so that a husband feels comfortable and competent and involved. Next slide, please. So um, I took out a cartoon that I didn't have permission to share, but let me describe it. And it was a woman talking to a man who was wrapped in bandages like a duck like a mummy, right, head to toe. And the caption is, it's or always poor you, isn't it, Albert? And, and, uh, and this is not meant to be sexist. I'm not making stereotypes. But we often don't always understand how much the other person is doing. And when there is, in essence, a breadwinner and a stay-at-home parent, we often think the breadwinner has it easier. This is a quote from that father study that had 300 and, and some fathers. Um, and he wrote, prior to my son, we were two income family. I've had to strive to advance as quickly as possible to bridge the financial gap that was introduced when we made the decision for my wife to leave the workforce to focus on our son. The pressure is immense. The fear and constant reminder of how crucial my professional success is to my family is frankly unbearable. Emotionally, we face so many medical challenges daily, weekly, and monthly. It's been very difficult to maintain such a high level of stress. And, and I suspect she doesn't see that when he comes home from work, right? Because she has her own stressors and he may come home ornery, wanting private time, et cetera. Next slide, please. So mutual appreciation, which can feel awkward, especially when you're feeling resentful and tapped out, is really important. Um, and I put this with feel awkward at first, so I gave you some ways to do it. Thank you for fill in the blank. It was nice that you, I noticed that you, I, and I know that should be coming both ways, but you're working on your side of the street, your own changes first, which is expressing appreciation. Next slide, please. So, uh, role chain, it, roles. So, when there is a crisis such as around diagnosis, um, what often happens is, uh, and it's often the woman, if she's working, the decision is made um, that she'll be the stay at home parent and the other one will be a breadwinner. And that, uh, like crises, that often feels reasonable. It, it, that decision may, become, may come with some grief, but maybe not resentment. But over time, that can change. And as one parent said, uh, one spouse meeting to stay at home, one gets the role of doctor, caretaker, researcher, coordinator, therapist, advocate, while the other continues much of the life they had before the diagnosis. And that's that issue of resentment. What I write about in the book with Fran Fazan, I don't do it alone, has to do with roles. And you see those trains running on separate tracks. Often there's this divide and conquer um, when there's serious illness with the child and divide and conquer work short term long term it's a problem right that's how we end up in the resentment dance doing things by ourselves 
So I pasted in a picture of kind of intersecting tracks, ways to build it in. So it's not in essence a mother doing all of it. Okay, next slide please. Or a husband, I've had it both ways. So this is that issue of working more towards teamwork. And the, this is uh, when I talk about the resentment dance. Um, and I, uh, I have an article in Autism File on this kind of changing that dance. And part of it is making space. Once you get good and your partner may not be as um, up to speed with some of your child's needs, we still need to make space for them to learn. And so often uh, in a mother's head, it's I can do it faster, he won't do it right. I know about this more than he does. So they won't delegate tasks and the partner gets less able. There's also that issue of giving up control, right? I had one mother who would listen at the door as her husband would interact with the son, yet she then could criticize him and say, he doesn't interact with our son enough. They don't have enough of a relationship. So we have to make space. And this goes back to valuing two opinions and differences. When I put, you know, we get in the expert parent role. And I know in my situation, being a psychologist, and specializing in disability. I, you know, I felt like I had the answers and I should have the answers and people pay for my opinion. And, and there were times my husband, who's a salesman, had so much more correct than I did. Um, so we take, we have to take our egos out of that and embrace that other point of view because sometimes we're wrong. Okay, next slide, please. So I still work on this. And that is, if you think about communication, right? We wanna say things in a way that can be heard, not to just get out our anger. And you know, it's that concept of keep your eye on your prize. If, if the prize, on the prize, if the prize is to get your partner to understand something differently, you can only do that if you're minifying his or her defensiveness, being clear, being willing to understand uh, your partner's viewpoint. And I call it practicing gentle assertiveness and asking for what you want. I mean, my husband, good thing he's out because he might laugh at the gentle, but I try it off that if something's really important, I go gentle, right? And I drop my voice. Um, so, when I talk about using good communication skills, it's so you get what you want or need. Next slide, please. So there's a really good, it came from an article, she turned it into a book, uh, this Amy Sutherland. And uh, her quote, she was an animal trainer and she talked about, um, well, it, it's in the article, what she taught me about a happy marriage. And when I do workshops, sometimes I, um, pass out copies of it. But she was an exotic animal trainer who talked about lessons from training animals that she applies to her marriage. And I love this quote. She said, nobody ever got a seal to balance a ball in its nose by nagging. And, you know, nagging's funny because I don't like the stereotype of women nagging, but she's right, right? She's right. That seal would never learn to balance it, okay? And it's also about shaping approximations, when they get it partly right, right, we give them a macro, all that. But help your partner, i.e. SEAL, learn what you need or want. Okay, next slide, please. Ask rather than criticize. This is one that I um, really try to be mindful of, right? So anytime we start out with, I can't believe you don't know better than to do whatever, what's wrong with you, how many times you'll have to ask you to. Not that I've ever said any of these. So um, as hard as it is, ask for what you want instead of repeatedly telling him or her what they did wrong. It's that asking and describe what you want your spouse to accomplish in behavioral terms. It's like working with that seal and it's not meant to be disrespectful. You spell it out, right? I have a new pup, he's learning how to greet me, right? Not with muddy paws on my chest, right? But 
sit and be a good boy, right? And you shape up when they're getting closer. And I'm also saying focus on the 20% that really matters. All too often, I see good marital change. And then one says, but what about this? You know, and they kind of trample on all the new change. So, okay, next slide, please. So, um, empathic listening, it's often called active listening. It is a skill um, that you can never, ever go wrong with. And I know, like, police will use it to defuse people or somebody's on a building, right? And maybe to jump, they use empathic listening and essentially and you could find this anywhere on the internet or most any books listen and paraphrase what you hear your partner saying without adding commentary or debate and the phrase you can use it's what counselors learn to do let me see if i understand what you're saying and you don't add any more and you don't debate it it's Helpful to respect and acknowledge a partner's point of view, even if you disagree with it. That's why you don't start with what you want to say. You can even say, let me think about that in your buy time. And acknowledging your partner's point of view doesn't mean you're agreeing with it. You don't have to debate it. It means you understand it. Okay, next slide, please. So this was my favorite cartoon that I had to take out. So let me describe it. It was from the New Yorker. <laughs> And I tried to get permission, but I couldn't get into their website. So it has a couple in bed and then um, the wife's mother-in-law in the middle and the line between the couple. And it says something like, oh, heaven's sake, Melissa, I can't ask her to leave. She's my mother, All right? Which I find <laughs> very funny. You can look it up. And it has to do with setting boundaries, right? Just as I want you to not be consumed, that's a form of boundary setting. This is boundaries about protecting romance and sexual intimacy. And we need boundaries about protecting our own little slice of the pie too. So uh, um, this is an interchange from a couple in, in our marriage book. Uh, and they have a child who was so medically fragile. I don't remember, they have twins, what it was, but it was life-threatening. I think one was, uh, had a trach. And well, you can see they have 24-hour nursing. So she said, uh, well, we don't have in the house is the intimacy of a normal marriage because we have a million people here. And so we can't, should say, make out in the kitchen. We can, but that would feel foolish. And he said, uh, we have a nurse on the other side of our wall 24 hours a day in two shifts. You even learn to make love differently. So this is a couple who decided to use some creativity. It doesn't mean, and I have protect and or rebuild. Most often we're talking about rebuilding. Next slide, please. So um, these are both people who contributed to the book. And it's contrasting approaches with that same issue of with all these stressors, do we um, this, do we make ourselves um, greet the challenge with some creativity or do we say it's impossible? So one parent wrote, what romance? I have to sleep with my child as she's afraid at night and will look for me if she awakens and I'm not there. I cannot tell you how many times I know that and I'll comment on it. And then this is from another couple. Typical times to make love are just not available to us due to our children's sleeping problems. However, we develop the attitude to take opportunities when they present themselves, like when the kids are out. Uh, it may not be ideal, but it can be romantic if you let it be kind of like being teenagers again. So I've had some very romantic couples. I have one now where... Uh, they have to, they do have to take turn sleeping in the child's room uh, for fear they'll lose their child at night. Uh, they still have, they take turns, they have a sexual intimacy, but not at night in their own beds. Um, one of the most romantic couples I had, had a child who had such severe seizures that they could never be more than 15 minutes from the hospital. And they would have these romantic dates at home and um, regularly. 
Um, there's nothing wrong with planning romance and date nights where you don't watch your kids. Like it's, it's great if it's spontaneous, but feeling uh, at all sexual, uh, it's often hard for that to be uh, spontaneous um, when you're out <laughs> in the real world, much less uh, uh, kids with illnesses and disabilities. So I think you get my point about be creative, be mindful and, and figure it out. Next slide, please. Um, oh, so let me add one thing to the last slide, which I thought might be on the next one, but um, the part about sleeping with children, and I was a bad offender, finally we had to buy a little bed where the kids wouldn't fit. So I know, it's really hard to not sleep with children and it feels really hard to get out of that. Uh, and it's more likely if the kid has special needs, uh, but it's possible. And I once had a woman come and she said her marriage was so much better. And um, uh, I said, what changed? She said, we unpiled the mammal bed, meaning all the kids pop in their bodies in their bed. So it can be done. It is not easy um, uh, for a few weeks, but it can be done. It is so important. There's someone I know now, right? The kid is in bed with her and the husband's in the guest room. Like you don't, you don't want that, nor do you need that. And that one got solved actually. So, okay, next slide, please. So John Gottman and his work is really good if you're, um, interested in reading more about marriage. He talked about repair gestures and, and his concept, and it's a step that's easy to remember, is turn towards rather than away. So as we go throughout the day, we have so many opportunities to turn, turn towards our partner rather than away. And I um, interviewed a couple where they lived uh, in a trailer and the child had a lot of violent behaviors, but when they would get into an argument, they, it's a version of turn towards, um, they'd sit next to each other side by side. It, it, that's really turning towards. But let's say you're angry with your spouse, there's no, right? You could argue from across the room or you could go sit next to them and it changes it up. It breaks the tension. There is a concept in 12 step programs about do the next right thing. So let's say you said some things you wish you hadn't said, you do the next right thing, or your spouse says something to you, right? You do the next right thing, which is often turning towards and acting how you're, you would want your partner to act. My husband's version of repair gestures, you'll see a steaming cup of coffee. <laughs> Just always bring me a coffee. We may have words and I end up with a cup of coffee or I have a cup of coffee, right, in the morning. So. Repair gestures um, don't take much time. Uh, and it's a way of changing that dance when things have gone a bit sour. Next slide, please. So uh, I think this, this is my next to last slide. This, um, it says practice realistic expectations and realistic forgiveness. We could talk more about forgiveness. That's another day. But one mother said to me, she was not so great about taking care of her marriage. And she said, I have a special needs child. I can't have a special needs husband, meaning he had to do it all right all the time. And let me end with the next slide. So this is from either the husband or the wife uh, raising three kids with fragile X. And I think two are nonverbal. One has a very severe cardiac problems. And I think that, um, they still wear diapers and they're adults now. Uh, and one of the two said to me, the advice I give to couples who sail into a storm and are fighting is, quote, don't hack at your boat in a storm. If you're in the middle of a crisis, don't take the very support you have and start whacking at it because that's dumb. You should love, nurture, and care for that other person. You're not going to make it through the storm. And really, Lindy, that's kind of what you talked about when you introduced this session. So I agree. And the next slide I think is just contact information. Um, yeah. So 
that's the formal part of this. Oh, that was fantastic. <laughs> oh, well, let me see if I can um, stop my screen share um, and see if we can get both of us talking. Um, I, I've got I've got lots of great questions. Um, I love if, uh, if anybody else does, please, you know, pop in. Um, so. <sighs> Gosh, it was so good. You know, when I read your book and even just listening to you again, Dr. Marshak, it's, it seems so obvious. <laughs> these, you know, these tips, they seem just kind of do this and do this and, but, and not obvious in a bad way, it, obvious and like, oh, I should have thought of that. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, right, of course. And um, I just, uh, I just want to say that, that, that it helps to really see them itemized in, in 10 points, because you know maybe if you were talking to your child or your child was having challenges with a relationship, you could go through that, but being in it, it's you know, tough. it's different. <laughs> and I agree with you, there are things we kind of know, but it seems over, and we're humans and it's overwhelming to do them all. And that's why I said, so think about one or two, just do one or two well someday do another. Yeah. So here's a question. Um, at the most fundamental part of this, um, I have found for myself, and I hear this from lots of other parents as well, um, this need for reserves, this need for energy, so that you can even put effort into changing what you're going to change, even if it's just one or two things. And it seems so integrally is that a word integrally yeah. <laughs> related <Literally>. thank yeah. <laughs> you um in order to get self-care well you have to be able to communicate with your spouse so or the respite so how do we how do we how do we find a place to break in at the cycle does that make sense it makes beautiful sense and i had to leave some things out um but one of the things that I did leave out, talked about what are fair roles. And um, what often happens is one person has more discretionary time than the other. And so you're absolutely right that it's not easy to get that time for self-care. And when I said um, address the 20% that's really important, one is that time. And uh, I've had many clients work on it. I probably had someone last week to have to say to her husband, but I need this and this is why. And that's one of those conversations that is not so easy. And that's why I'm saying use really good communication skills and gentle assertiveness. That's something to go back to again and again. And there are many different ways to say it, but you cannot be expected to function in this life without time for self-care. And so it's a reasonable request. And often I'll say, with my own assertiveness, or I'll say it with others, that there's nothing wrong with saying this is a reasonable request. I'm sure you can understand why I need X, Y, and Z. And one is exercise, right? I focused on the, you know, I talk about other things I do for self-care, but even um, walking, when you look at the research about the impact of walking, it functions as well um, as an antidepressant for mild depressions. That's different than for severe, but that's all totally important. And, um, and that's one of those things I would not give up on. It can be done with respite care. It could be done paying a neighbor's Kid, I know it's harder during COVID to come, but it, it's essential. And um, I mean, it's like driving a car with no gas in it. You can't do it no matter how hard you try. So um, yeah, does that answer it? It does. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because um, something you say in the book too is the marathon versus the sprint. Is that right? Absolutely. <laughs> and Dr. Marshak, man, I can run a good sprint for a really, really, really long time. 
Yeah, yeah, that's different, right? Um, yeah. Um, so we have to prepare for life as a marathon. I agree with you. And um, yeah. Um, we we have some more questions coming in. I know we started a little bit late. Do you have maybe another five minutes to chat? With? I have as much time as you need. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Marshak. Thank you. Um, so some questions coming in. Um, the first one, do you work with parents um, out of state or through Zoom right now? Um, I have a little bit. Um, my problem is lately I haven't been taking anybody new because um, it's by telehealth mm -hmm. and a lot of states won't permit it on an ongoing basis and different states have licensing laws. So I've done a little bit of that. Um, I might do a little bit more in the future. It depends on the state. So for example, I'm seeing someone in Arizona where they will allow it on an ongoing basis, but it's that provision, they permitted it due to COVID. So yeah, uh, um, but, but um, you know, I, I did, put my contact information down and I wouldn't mind, you know, if someone wanted to send me an email or, or to have a brief conversation, not necessarily on going therapy, that I don't mind doing just to do. Right. So. Uh, and if you are unable to help, do you have a, a network of other therapists? Because I find that this is a field that is just, <laughs> there's nobody in it. <laughs> I know that, and you know, I know someone who wants to go into it. I just had this conversation and said, please, please do because, uh, but I will say one more thing about this. Um, if you have a skillful therapist, um, they can learn from you. So, um, Disability aside, um, as a psychologist, right? I can help couples or individuals with things I've never experienced um, as long as um, I know what I don't know and um, uh, I work hard to understand that other person's life. So I'm glad you asked that question, Lindy, because you're right, there are very few people, but a good therapist who, who can learn to get you in your situation, they're, they're out there. So it doesn't have to be somebody with a specific expertise. And I know as a therapist, like right now, I have a lot of people with binge eating disorder, I'm reading about it and I'm learning more about it. You know, I mean, a good therapist stretches and they'll read and learn what they need to as well. And uh, yeah, so um, so even if you can't find somebody, you can find a good therapist. Thank you for that. Um, here's a question. Uh, when you treat your spouse how you want them to treat you, yeah. but you feel like that isn't getting you anywhere, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> um, I use my communication skills and uh, and my children or my husband know when I drop my voice like this, <laughs> I, it means I'm really serious about something I'm talking about. And then I will use, I'll be clear about what I'm asking for. I might use um, illustrations based on how I act towards them. And that that is what I would like to receive back. I in that voice tone, right? Because, you know, when I talk about reciprocity in terms of making changes, it doesn't mean that alone is enough. The other thing I want to add, which didn't make it to the PowerPoint because of time and there's more to learn. I think it is in the book, uh, but it's other places too. Conflict is fine in a marriage. In fact, conflict avoided marriages are not the healthiest or most stable. So to learn how to have conflict and an argument and maybe a fight, but doing it well with proper rules, nothing wrong with that. So if you have to argue it out, 
now and then with a little bit more um, um to it. That's okay too. But we don't want to just sweep it under the carpet and resent it because that's worse. And they're worse things than um, an argument. It's like, you know, a storm, it kind of clears the air of it, as long as we don't say awful things. And Dr. Marshak, would you suggest having these conversations when you've just had it? And it's built no, up? no, not that I've never had one. <laughs> that I have, but, um, not, but typically, and John Gottman, who's a great marital researcher, he, um, you can find his books easily. Um, he talks about soft startups that you don't want uh, to have most of the conversations. Um, uh, and he said, men get more kind of aroused, more defensive, more activated than women very quickly. And he suggests soft startups. So it could be something like, can we talk tonight about something that can't get off my mind and you start and I, that way. Um, that doesn't mean you should never ever do it in the heat of the moment. That maybe that's when you can do it, right? But with that, be careful that you don't say something that you wished you could take back. You know, there was another cartoon that had like a man sitting next to a nuclear bomb and something about, uh, and the woman saying, my husband listens much better now that he knows that I have this weapon. So we have to be careful with the weapons in our arguments, right? Because we could win an argument, but kind of decimate. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah, that, that's great. Um, I like that point that you brought up. This is something I never knew uh, about my husband until he just, you know, said it. Um, again, that whole being inside the relationship instead of that uh, that distance. Um, he said, you know, if you can just let me know ahead of time that you want to talk about something a little bit later, then then that helps. And for me, I grew up in a family where my mom was a counselor. She was a therapist. We talked about anything, anytime, anywhere. And so. Um, just me having that piece of information from him, like, okay, this will help him be in a better mindset so I can get accomplished what I need to get done. It was helpful. Oh, is everybody frozen? I'm frozen. need to talk as much as we need to talk to somebody in-laws are not a good idea uh, as the ones to be involved in a marriage um, they can provide support like babysitting so you can go out with your partner um, yeah it just reminded me of that pie that you'd shown and there was four five people so it's 20 percent each person so in-laws should not get a little slice. What a good way to put it. You're so right. And, and the other thing I want to add, and especially if you have a child with serious illness, um, in-laws often become more involved, but just because you're more involved doesn't mean there shouldn't be a boundary around that marriage. They're not entitled to a piece of pie there. Yeah, but you said it well, Leona, thank you. It looks like Lindy's back. Oh, thank you. Thank you for taking over. I had to go back to what you were saying. I remember the, the family you grew up with. Oh, yes. You said your mother was a counselor. Yes. Um, 
So uh, it, it was neat, just different styles of communicating. It wasn't so much that he didn't want to talk about it. He just needed to be prepared a little bit to switch from work, work, work all day to, oh, my wife just dropped something in my lap that I wasn't ready for. And so that's so true. And I tend to have the nature that maybe your mother had was, if I want to talk about it, I want to talk about it then. But if it's really important, right, I'll go do something else and bring myself down. But John Gottman talks about it very much. Physiologically, men get, uh, I think maybe he calls it flooding. I may have the term wrong. He talks about flooding. That they get more wash in emotion and their blood pressure goes up more and stays up than women physiologically when they're heading into these emotional discussions. I can see it with mine too, by the way. And um, so that's also the practical reason why you may want your husband to chill a little bit before the discussion. And it's really they're regulating their um, blood pressure and arousal. But I don't let things, you know, I wouldn't wait days. Sure. And, and I have too many women looking for the perfect time to talk to somebody. <laughs> Just don't pick the worst time, you know? Well, another tip he gave me was exactly that. He's like, you know, it's, it's hard for, it's really hard for me to talk at night because I'm exhausted. And then it gets me riled up so I can't go to sleep. And I was like, yeah, he's right. Oh, that's good to know because for me, it's off my chest and I can go to sleep and I'm great. <laughs> yeah. um, that's a great point. And your husband knew that without reading John Gottman's book, which is very impressive. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. What all have we gotten through? Uh, okay, and the, this is a great question. Um, did y'all cover the part about your spouse getting their own self-care? Uh, no, we didn't talk about that. So, okay. you, I want to use some old cliche. You can lead a no disrespect. <laughs> you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Yeah. So we can try, and sometimes we're successful. Um, I do believe in leading by example. Almost everybody I know has benefit. You know, you don't have to be in bad shape to benefit from a good therapist. And um, I think that there's a way um, to phrase it. All we can do is our best effort at explaining why we think it might be a good idea. If it's heard uh, by a husband, is there something wrong with me? And she thinks I need to be fixed. The defensiveness goes up. But if it's, I think this would be helpful. And this is why I think it. So we can do, yeah. So the other thing that sometimes happens is um, sometimes I've seen this a lot in my practice as an outgrowth from couples therapy, the man may end up going in to therapy individually because he's no longer scared of it, um, able to look at some of his own issues without a defensiveness and in a, in a useful way. Um, the other thing I want to say about marital counseling, oh, and with, with a good marital therapist, the individuals make individual changes too. I mean, it kind of goes with the territory. So sometimes there's good partner growth and health in the context of marital therapy. Um, and the other piece, let me add, is, is the research on marital therapy is people wait too long to go. So it doesn't have the same success rate because they wait uh, uh, till it's almost over. So. So I, I love that you brought that up and there was a slide too that um, I, I wanted to comment on. Um, I, I think we're, we're mostly um, moms here, um, but I feel bad for the guys because there's so much stigma with men being emotional or reflecting on their emotions. And unfortunately, even though it's changing, there's still a lot of stigma around mental health. And, you know, if you mention to, <laughs> to a husband, hypothetically, um, <laughs> that it might be helpful. <laughs> um, th there's just a lot of, I can do it on my own. And it's, 
I don't know. I don't know. And I hear what you're saying about that little, a, a soft, gentle, um, but I, I think it can also be turned into, oh, she thinks I'm broken, even if it's yeah, a nice, I gentle think there's life. a way to say, and I think it's true. Um, and I've said this to children and others and families, which is what you're trying to do is hard. And it's not that I don't think you can do it. But if there are people available to help you with it, why not use them? Like, why kind of trudge up the mountain by yourself? I'll follow this. I want you to consider it. So even if someone could do it by themselves, it's much easier with another person. Um, and, and to have a partner with them. So it, I think it's all in the language, but you're right that men have, um, uh, they see therapy much more as a sign of weakness and stigma. And, and I, that's been going on that way for a long time. You know, there are, uh, Robert Nasif is um, a psychologist who's worked a lot with fathers. It may be of kids on the spectrum, but you know, now and then there are like fathers groups and things that useful but yeah that that may not fill the need that you're talking about yeah along those lines um for anybody here who's Duchenne related I, I've seen this need for um support for the dads and so I've created a monthly um dads group that um the physical therapist Doug Levine heads up um when so if there's yeah any when? Duchenne people um, here's another question. Like I said, that may be one of the most important strategies. It could, right, that may be part of a father's group with other people who understand it. That can also lead to some powerful changes. So, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, and actually when I, when I started when, when I started this group, there's, you know, analytics that you can look at on your page. And um, I saw that 90% of the people who were, you know, following and active in my group were women. I was like, 90%? What about these guys? Where, where is their support? <laughs> Absolutely. And um, that article I wrote, Listening to Fathers really starts out with that because it has to do with even the professionals tend to dismiss the men. You know, the professionals that come out to the home often kind of sweep the fathers aside and they are left without support. And um, you're at, you're so right. And um, it's funny though, I, I gave a talk, the Andes Mount, Mountains in Peru, right before COVID, this little town in the Andes, and all these men took off work to come, <laughs> which I've never seen in the U.S. as much. So there's a cultural component. I thought that's, you know, there's a cultural piece. But yeah. It does go out um, to the situation of fathers. Yeah. Um. So here's a great question from, from one of my good friends. And um, this is something that we experienced also. Um, you know, my, my husband and I, we love each other and we work hard for each other. And we, you know, try, try to say thank you when we've got enough energy to do it. Um, but it's our communication. We have so many hurt feelings just around communicating because there's so much interpretation that goes in from tone and not tone and just hammering something out versus but <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So um, in terms of just communicating, um, is couples therapy uh, an option? Is that one way to? I think it's a great way. Okay. And, and I think that like, there's a couple I'm seeing now um, and it's interesting because the man asks for individual sessions now and then, right? He's, he's understanding what he brought to it. But I'm hearing about hurts 
that occurred a long time ago that get in the way of the present. And um, easier said than done a little bit, but if now and then at the end of the discussion, you kind of debrief and say, did I say anything that, that hurt you and you hear it rather than it piling up. And when I do couple sessions, I often, and you know, right, the clock dictates when you're over. I often say, are there any loose ends that really need to be wrapped up now, which is in essence, is somebody hurt or did I say something too strong to somebody? So there's no reason why you couldn't modify that a little bit with the husband. You know, like this is a hard conversation. I hope I didn't say anything you got hurtful. Or, or if he says it to you, you could say, right, my feelings are hurt. Could we talk about this again in a few days? But you don't want them to pile up. You know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. There's, um, there's a saying, uh, what is it? Always talk things out before you go to bed or never. I thought about that. Never go to bed mad, which was my <laughs> motto when I was newly married. I was thinking about that the other day. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, I like it in theory, but for me, I'm such a thinker that if I were to talk when I'm still emotional, I know things would explode and <laughs> neither of us would sleep well. Um, so I like what you said about uh, I need a couple days. Can we talk about this again? And that's okay. It, it's really okay. You know, my we had the saying, don't go to bed and add. Which, yeah, that's what it is. Uh, I did for many years, not all 38 years. So, but, you know, my husband has a saying, which I really like, and I think about it. And I'm sure he applies to the marriage, which is tomorrow's a new day. Mm -hmm meaning you start fresher and what you couldn't talk about one night, maybe you can the next day. I like that idea of tomorrow's a new day. Um, I just have a, a couple more points. And if, if nobody else has anything to chat, then we can, um, we can let you enjoy your Saturday. Um, I, I'm having a great time <laughs> right now, Dr. Marshall. <laughs> um, so that idea of... Um, compounded offenses, um, you know, well, you did this however many years ago and, and hanging on to that, um, you know, I, I feel like there can be this big emotional defense almost because, you know, well, you promised you'd have my back. We got married and now it's not what I thought it was going to be. Could you talk about that at all and how it can kind of snowball? Yes. So, um, it can, obviously, and snowball is a good word. Um, so I'm thinking two things. One is um, what you're trying to do, which is to talk often so that there's less of a, a mound. Um, but the other pieces and I've done this myself uh, in my marriage and, and I see it a lot with couples there can come a time where you say that was then this is now mm. all right that uh, I didn't talk a lot about forgiveness it, I probably will next time but um at at some point after things are talked through you kind of have to draw a line in the sand and let someone have a fresh start. And I may have put it in the book or it may be from a, a talk I've ever given about bankruptcy laws, right? Bankruptcy laws were so that people were not always indebted or went down and could have a fresh start. And um, that's true about marriages too. It's even true with marriages where there's been an affair that at some point, and that's many, that's a whole nother topic. But at some point you say that was that we can't always be dragging up the past. The past has to be talked about. And then at some point it is only the past. And I will bring it up sometimes for uh, the past for illustration, which is probably not the best thing 
to do. So it may be coming up that way. Um, but, but to stay in the present or the recent past makes much greater sense. And couples that keep going back to the past really get nowhere. I, I'm not saying you won't get anywhere, but right, it's not what you want to be doing. And if it was, you wouldn't have raised this as a question. Um, we have a question in the chat and then we'll get to you, Marianne. Is that okay? Okay, um, so here's a question and, and this uh, ties into some of your previous quotes uh, and, and it's, it's a good one. Um, we've got Medicaid and we have somebody coming to our house and that's helping take a load off, but there's always somebody around. <laughs> um, so how do you maintain privacy in a marriage when you've got yeah um, around? you seek it and that's not as simplistic as it sounds so i think about like all my kids are adults now but we know teenagers find ways to be sneaky and have their private lives right under our noses right and they could do it in, in a busy house and so in many ways couples just need to be creative and maybe a little stealthy and sneaky and you make it happen and there are like those white noise machines or a professional understanding you want to go in the other room with your spouse, right? You just, it's one of those things where you, you decide you need to be intentional about it because it's got to happen and you're going to figure it out. Like the one quote with the couple saying, you know, how we learn, I know you're not necessarily talking about sex, but I use that one as an example, right? How we learn to make this work with somebody on the other side. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of couples that have had um, people almost all the time in, in the home. And uh, if it's for conversation in that romance, you go outside, right? Or you use respite care and you go away for a night, but you just, that's one of those places where you have to be very intentional and creative and dedicated to making that happen. Thank you for that. Um, Marianne, would you like to chat? Yes, thank you, Lindy. Yeah, um, sure. Dr. Marshak, this and Lindy's session has been amazing, and oh, that so information good. is so valuable. Um, <laughs> and so, definitely, I would definitely encourage everyone to take this information to heart and try to practice it. And, and uh, sometimes it's hard, and sometimes people wait too late. And unfortunately, in my situation, I just had to go through a divorce. So, I wish this information or I had. You know, practice some of these principles early on, earlier in the marriage. It kind of got to a point where it was too late, even though I would have liked it to, you know, to work, but it just didn't. Sometimes you have to just, you know, come to that that situation. And so now I'm in a process where I uh, help people through the special needs divorce, and I'll, I'll follow up with you separately on that. But my question is, um, so say somebody, you know, has gone through a split, separation, divorce, whatever the case might be. Do you advise? Um, joint therapy at that point, or do you ever feel like the other ex-spouse may be open to that? Just yeah, for so, sorry. Yeah. I, I started trying to answer while you were still talking. So um, I don't know if you know that I wrote a book called like Going Solo, um, but it has a big chapter on divorce and it, it um, it's going solo, something about raising kids with disabilities. And it has a big chapter on divorce. And so I write a lot about that. Um, there's also a, a chapter about remarriage too, which is interesting. Um, and remarriage, um, even with more than one kid with a disability or illness. So not that that's the main goal in life, but just so you kind of know what's in there. Um, I, I've rarely had a, I've had couples for therapy about, and I had one last year, we're going to dissolve this marriage and can you help us so that we can co-parent together? I've had that a few times. That's hard to get, um, but it makes some sense. So what you're saying, so it's kind of a yes to what you're saying. Um, the goal is, and I quote somebody who wrote something like Divorce 101, it's in that book, 
and that book's on Amazon, and they talked about how our marriage was dead, but our co-parenting wasn't, and how does one um, kind of bury the marriage yet um, be good co-parents. And I have um, kind of stories and the advice from several people who ended up co-parenting better, uh, uh, kids with disabilities than when they were married. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Yeah, so that might be useful to you. And, uh, and I'm sure there are other sources of information. So therapy is one option, but it's really saying that, you know, it's kind of that was then, this is now. The marriage is then and we're not going to go there, right? But for the sake of our child, let's be successful co-parenting. I've had a number of people do that. Right. I appreciate that. I'll definitely look into that book. That's, I wasn't aware of that before, but yeah, I think that I, is it's on Amazon under... Oh, under Marshak, it's not one yeah, of For yeah. sure, for sure. Because I think, I mean, that, that is the intent, you know, through the marriage and through, you know, after the marriage and whatever the case may be for everybody, you know, their children are priority and, you know, the spouse, you know, of course needs to be or the ex-spouse, you know, that's a little different afterwards. But like you said, it, the children are always important and you want to try to co-parent as well as you can. So, yeah. And I've known some people with great success at that. Um, that that's realistic. Okay. Thank you. That's a good question. So this goes into another one of my questions. And Dr. Marshak, I'm going to test you on your own book. Um, <laughs> um, what is a good enough marriage? You have two questions listed in here um, because, uh, you know, I, I know that the grass is greener <laughs> on the other side. And I heard somebody say once, um, um, Oh gosh, she was quoting her mom or something who, who had been divorced or I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but she said something like, you're just trading these problems for another set of problems. There's, there's always going to be conflict. Um, I, I may have simplified it, but go, go ahead. So, and I haven't read that chapter for a long time, but it's such an important question. And I probably said something like I'm saying now. <laughs> a good enough marriage does not include abuse, that abuse is a deal breaker. It doesn't mean you can't separate and have somebody go for treatment, but ongoing abuse, I think it's a deal breaker. And it's very abuses of your kids who witness it too. So that to me is a deal breaker. I'm not sure what I had as the other, but off the top of my head, and I think with active addiction, we try very hard to get someone into therapy. Um, this will sound odd, and this isn't what I wrote in the book. Uh, a good enough marriage now and then includes an episode of infidelity. And I know when I got married, I said, if my husband ever has an affair, I'm finished. And I don't think that's, I'm not big on affairs, but um, there's so many experts and I've, learn this myself from my marital therapy sometimes couples really heal well from that and it does not happen again and they work very hard and well with the therapist on what led up to it and so i don't see that as a deal breaker the same way i think about abuse i think repeated is another story and then i think there's that other part with um and esther perel has a wonderful video infidelity um, then there's that other part and i have somebody with that now where the partner is just demeaning right and they feel that it's worn away at them and they would be a better self without that person in that situation that's not good enough right if you no longer kind of recognize who you are and you're worn away and diminished by that other person to me that's not good enough um those are the main ones i mean i you know i think marriage is hard i think most marriage i'm still working on things 38 years later but it's a good enough marriage because there's enough that's good and i feel good about who i am and that you know in that marriage there's right so there's got to be 
respect and enjoyment and, and not to be too deteriorated from it. I don't know if I, I'm not sure what I wrote in the book. I'm sure I wrote about abuse. Yeah, um, de definitely. There were those deal breakers. Um, and then a, a couple of things you mentioned were, um, does your spouse love you? And does your spouse love and accept your child with disabilities? Absolutely. And um, yeah, and that's that part about not being diminished. Yeah. Right? But uh, um, we can love somebody and hurt them sometimes or not be sensitive because we're overwhelmed. And those to me are not deal breakers. But I, for me, when that love is gone, I have somebody in that situation now, then what do you have left? Do you have parent partners? Because if you're so angry with each other, you're probably not doing a good job living under one roof doing that. So that's not good enough in my eyes. Um, and I love how you emphasize, you know, life is hard, you know, it, it, marriage is in our face all the day, <laughs> every time. And so it's easy to, to kind of fixate on that. Um, but life in general is just hard. So, um, yeah, and absolutely. And that's the other reason um, to take care of the marriage and try to repair it, because it is that vessel. And, but I think that if marriage long-term makes your life way harder, like if they don't love your child and they'll never accept the disability, um, everybody's different on it. But for me then, then life would be easier being solo. But that's my belief system. And I think that if, if keeping that marriage together harms a child, That's not good enough to me. And thank you for bringing that up. You know, I, I grew up in a family where my parents were divorced. And looking back, you know, my dad had bipolar, which we didn't know about. And my mom was, um, you know, she had dysthymia. She was constantly, um, you know, just mild depression. And when I was growing up, I couldn't understand, oh my gosh, divorce, there's this stigma. But as I get older, I, I start to see, it's not that easy. You don't just say, yeah, I'll stand by you forever and ever and ever. There's, especially when you have kids like this little girl right here, there are really big decisions to be made and things get really complicated and it's not easy. <laughs> uh, let's see, did you freeze again? Oh. I know. Oh, I think I'm. I think requires thinking about it from many angles. Um, you know, it's not so simplistic about what's best for the children. Thank you. I just have two, two super quick, um, just okay. kind of, do we do this? Do we not do that? Okay. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I'm a question person. I just, I love to ask. I'm just um, so grateful. <laughs> Thanks, hey, sweetie, to be able to pick your brain. Um, <laughs> You want daddy to go do that? Can you go ask him? Uh -uh. No, okay. So my first question is, two questions. My first question is, um, is it okay to talk in front of the kids? And my second question is, um, when do you know if it's time <laughs> to start on um, anti-anxieties or antidepressants either for yourself or your spouse? Okay, so let me just jot that down so I get the second. <laughs> I'm gonna get her okay. set up real quick. You ready for the answer or not? Oh. 
I guess I should wait, right? Oh, no, no, no. She said go for it. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're recording. We'll, we'll, we'll circle oh, okay. back. So Believe me. Talking in front of the children, it's tricky. Mostly don't, but <laughs> mostly, right? But what the research actually says is uh, if children hear a conflict, if they see you to resolve it, and there isn't damage from them having seen that. Okay. So, so we're careful with how much we say in front of children. And it's, it's like, um, you know, on a continuum, you don't want to be on either extreme. So I have couples who are always fighting in front of their kids. That's not okay. Kids get really, really anxious. But if now and then there's been an argument and the kids hear it, but it's handled respectfully and it gets resolved. That's not bad for a kid. You know, I grew up in a home when we're talking about how people grew up where my mother denied that they ever had an argument. Although once I woke up to what I never had an argument. Well, I don't believe it for a second, but then, right, it's all swept under um, the rug. And then children don't learn how to handle their own when problems arise with the spouse. So, yeah, so, um, so, um, a little bit's okay, um, but not, not a lot. And Linda, you were out of the room, but I was saying, but if there is for them to see you resolve or talk civilly is, is, um, a really important learning opportunity. <gasps> Yes, it is. Um, and my next question, and uh, what about, the, you know what about the anti anxieties? Lindy, the one about medication? Yeah, yeah. Can y'all hear me okay, or is the background noise? No, I can hear you now. Okay. And I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it, and then I forgot it. So, you know, people are different on it. And I have a situation with it now where one partner went on and an antidepressant, the spouse was really unhappy about it. But she found, which is kind of my rule of thumb, which is I think we can try non-medication approaches first, right? Like taking care of ourselves and walking and uh, maybe meditation, maybe something else, maybe pickleball, may, right? We try other ways, but... Um, but is there a time where medication can be helpful? Absolutely. And there's nothing um, so wrong. Uh, and I've done it to say, you know, I actually think this might help you. And this is why I say it. So, um, yeah. But I don't think it's the first thing you try. Um, there was something, I want to go back to divorce for one second because it reminds me of that. I don't like Dr. Phil for many, many reasons, many, many reasons. So, um, but when he does say you have to earn your way out of a marriage, I think that makes sense. Not when it comes to abuse, right? Or someone not loving your kid, but when you're in those shades of gray of, is this good enough, right? So to try the talks, try marital therapy, I think makes sense. And what made me think of that is I'm thinking with anti-anxieties and antidepressants. You support people in other strategies that could help. If those medications, and I'm not at all um, opposed to them, and I think they're useful, um, but if they were that wonderful all to themselves, <laughs> it'd be nice. But usually you need other things as well. And often what they do is they get you out of a hole enough that you can practice other strategies that are helpful. So that answer it, Lindy. Uh, <laughs> yes, it did. And um, I um, am a, I'm a big proponent. <laughs> My daughter doesn't want me talking right now. I'm talking over her cartoon. <laughs> um, you you yes. tell her that's your slice of the pie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a big proponent of, of mental health, and I just want to share, in case anybody else is experiencing, just so you know you're not alone. Um, 
I, uh, I personally went through a, a big period of anxiety and I didn't realize how much anxiety I was having. Um, it was affecting the marriage, especially during COVID and um, it was triggering some of my OCD. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I saw a, um, my, our son has ADHD and I knew something was off in our relations. And I was like, you know, I'm just gonna check, see if I have ADHD just to be responsible. We'll get my husband checked too. And so I talked to her and she's like, no, you don't have ADHD, but you have anxiety. <laughs> I'm like, what? I do know I don't. And so I started on some anti-anxieties um, and it, it's a new world. And I can see how a lot of my own behaviors were really feeding in to some of the patterns, some of the dance moves. <laughs> hey, I'm so glad you shared that. And I'm going to answer that question a little more based on what you said. Okay. It also happens with depression that we see through our partner through or our life through that lens. And, you know, depression has a thought disorder with, it. you know, we think about it with schizophrenia, but it goes with depression too. And it goes with anxiety. Absolutely. And so um, there really is, yes, I almost can't add to what you said because that's not just garden variety. That's when you feel something may be wrong. Absolutely. I'm a proponent of that. And I, I read something interesting, at, at least with Duchenne itself, if you're a carrier, you've got a, a higher propensity to anxiety. So, so do the manifesting, you know, the boys themselves. But even just in the life, of being a parent of special needs, there is a higher rate of anxiety and depression simply from the environment. So, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it, 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 some of you may or may not know it, but antidepressants also work on, an, on anxiety, right? That they're not really two separate disorders always. So. Oh, thank you for that, Dr. Marshak. Man, you're amazing. I knew this was going to be phenomenal. I knew it was. And I was just... I didn't let you down. When someone says, oh, you're going to be so good, I'm like, mm. <laughs> so I, I'm happy that it. Uh... Oh, gosh, yes. And um, it's just, again, such important stuff that people don't talk about. And, and if you do find a, a friend you can talk to it about it with, it's, you know, it's just kind of layperson well, kind of speculation, you know, well, I think it could be this or yeah, he's really doing that. I can't believe he would do that, you know, sort of thing. And so to have this expert advice and opinion, I just, I really value it for our parents. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you included this topic and valued it. And even what you shared about mental health is just really, really important. I think your father's group's really important. So, right, we're doing a lot that matters. Okay. All right, we officially uh, took over your entire morning, afternoon. So, <laughs> so grateful, so grateful. I, I, um, it was fun and interesting and I learned some things too, so. Magnificent. Um, and yeah, I, I think the, the going solo is so important too. So um, maybe we'll, we'll see if we can, we can bring you back on That's another day. My favorite thing that I've written. <laughs> <laughs> but it's different, but... Um, for Marianne, it, that may be a good fit with the people. And I don't say it that I'm, because I make maybe a dollar a copy. It's not that I'm good. <laughs> Grow rich on promoting it. So, okay. Oh, Dr. Morishak, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. It was great fun. All right. Yes. yes. Let's do this. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thank you.